What did Gojo see in Yuji that made him believe one day Yuji could be as strong as he was? Let's talk about that and also a bunch of other questions straight from you guys. Before we jump in, y'all, the timing of this donation was very serendipitous. Shout out to Kashimo Low Dips Utah. Uh, but the Discord is here. I am launching it right now. So whatever platform you're on, you should be able to find it in my profile. And if you're on YouTube, I will put a link to it in the pinned comment. So first up, the aforementioned question, what did Gojo see in Yuji? Well, first and foremost, the fact that Yuji is Sukuna's vessel and is able to suppress him is a talent that comes along once in a thousand years, as Gojo puts it. On top of that, Gojo thinks that one day Yuji will be able to use Sukuna's curse technique since he is soaked in his cursed energy. So right off the bat, Yuji is very special. On top of that, though, Yuji is a physical freak. He's breaking world records in the very first episode that we see him. So very physically gifted to add to the package as well. On top of that, though, as soon as he gets cursed energy and Gojo begins to teach him when they're watching the movies and Lord of the Rings and everything, uh, Yuji immediately picks up on how to control his cursed energy into that doll. Gojo is impressed with the speed at which he is learning. Another example of this is how quickly Yuji is able to pick up on Black Flash. So Yuji is a prodigy in almost all aspects of Jujutsu. And again, a physical demon right? So Gojo can see that potential in him and thinks that one day he could even be on par with him. Now this was a spoiler free answer because Samuel is an anime only, but for anybody who wants a more in-depth analysis on this topic, I do have a video on that using a lot of examples from the manga. So if that interests you, I will pin a comment with a link to that video. Also, while we're on this subject, we had this sponsor question from Ben, and Ben, you'll know what your question was, but I marked it out to be anime friendly here. That same video I was just referring to will answer your question and give you my thoughts on that. Next up, we've got this really interesting question from Prince on if Idol Transfiguration would work on Maharaga. So first, we need to decide, does Maharaga have a soul? Do Shikigami have souls? And I think they do. It's just not in the same way that, you know, we as humans would connotate having a soul. It's not as if they're self-aware or have the same level of consciousness as, say, humans or cursed spirits. And I actually have a video comparing Shikigami and cursed spirits. I'll link that down below for anybody that's interested. So Maharaga does have a soul, but how is his? how would his adaptation ability interact with Idol Transfiguration? So I think ultimately Maharaga would adapt to it fully before Mahito could finish him with it. Because as we know, you can use cursed energy to protect your soul somewhat. So I think Maharaga would be able to do that until he was able to fully adapt. So next up, we've got a couple of questions from Pei. The first one being, are there other Cursed Corpse users out there and could Mechamaru be considered one? Uh, so I think there are definitely other Cursed Corpse users out there. You know, Yaga, I think, is unique in what he's been able to accomplish, but I think in general that concept has been used other places in the world, just in the same way that there are many Shikigami users, but, you know, Ten Shadows is specific to the Zenin clan, if you will. Um, now, as far as if Mecha Maru would be considered one? I don't think so. Um, his case is unique because of his heavenly restriction, which enables him to use cursed energy at vast distances, which allows him to puppet these, you know, robots that he's built all over the place. But I wouldn't equate it to a cursed corpse because it's literally just Mechamaru who is piloting those robots, whereas a cursed corpse is kind of, you know, its own entity um, that is kind of operating based on instruction, but not like Yaga in the moment choosing what to do, if that makes sense. Then the second half of your question about if Shoko could be a cursed corpse user that literally uses corpses, that's a very creative idea, uh, but I don't think it's the case. In the JJK fan book, when Gege was talking Talking about Shoko's curse technique, he says she just has reverse curse technique. So I don't think she has a curse technique, but it is possible that that still could be revealed at some point. Next up, we got a few questions from V. The first one is, if I could do an analysis of who's more talented with more potential, Megami or Okotsu? Um, and I think Okotsu. I think this was honestly pretty easy. Megami obviously has massive potential with the Ten Shadows. That is a very powerful technique. We know that a Ten Shadows user and a Limitless Six Eyes user took each other out in the past, right? So obviously, it's got a lot of potential. But Okotsu has the potential and also has kind of followed through with it. No disrespect to Megami, but Okotsu was a nobody, not from like a famous clan, not with like a prestigious technique, and he became a special grade. 
Obviously, that's because of Rika, but still, I would loop that into Okotsu's own potential and talent, you know? Plus, I won't get into any spoilers, but, you know, at the end of JJK Zero, he loses Rika, yet here at the end of JJK Season 2, we know he's gotten her back, and he's able to re-attain that special grade status. That obviously takes a lot of talent and hard work, so I think I would, I would give this one to Okotsu pretty easily. Next up, you ask about how Toji took himself out and probably was thinking that he did the right thing with his son and that Gojo, you know, took care of it after he told him about it, but little did he know that Gojo had just been sealed and Megami was kind of in danger since Tsukuna was roaming about. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Toji just did the best with the information he had, right? I, th I don't think he had any understanding of, like, the unique circumstances that had led to him being able to use that body. I think it's interesting to consider if he had known everything about everything and known that he could maybe have potentially continued to exist like that, then maybe he wouldn't have taken himself out. But also it's like he knew he didn't belong here. His son was seemingly doing well without him. And, you know, he had just stabbed him in the belly. So he's just like, you know what, I'm going to do everybody a favor here. And finally, to your third question about the vast power differential between Maharaga and the rest of the Shikigami, it's certainly interesting, right? Because it is like way stronger than the others. But to me, that's just the pinnacle of power for the technique. I don't think that necessarily implies that Maharaga wasn't originally a part of it and was added at some point or anything, just because there's been no other precedent or or like allusion to that being the case. Speaking of Maharaga, next up we've got this question from Quinn who wants to know why Megami wasn't able to summon Maharaga during his fight with Sukuna in season one. So you're right in the first half there. He just decided not to. It wasn't that he couldn't. It's just that Yuji took back over so Megami realized he didn't have to pull out that trump card anymore. Next up we've got a really interesting one from I'm Gaming For You. Pause and read the whole thing if you would like to, but he's asking two things. One, if Gojo somehow got hit by Unlimited Void, like let's say we cloned Gojo and he domain expansioned himself, would he be immune to it and would he learn anything from this? I don't think he would be immune to it. Obviously, Gojo is immune to his own domain when he casts it, but that's not the same thing as just assuming he would be immune to an infinite amount of information should that be flooded into his brain. The six eyes obviously allow him to process at superhuman levels, but he wouldn't be able to do an infinite amount of information. Now, the second half of this question is, if Gojo could, or if someone theoretically could, would they gain a vast amount of knowledge? Like, it made me think of, you know, Ed in Full Metal Alchemist, like, peeking behind the door of truth. And if you were theoretically able to somehow process that information, you might come out of it, like, knowing more, like, having learned something from the experience, but I don't think you would literally be able to process and store an infinite amount of information. That's kind of like illogical right um so like maybe you know a few random facts about birds that you didn't before but i don't think it's like an enlightenment and speaking of the six eyes elijah asks if there are any other inherited traits like that and i really don't think so none that come to mind so this explains you know why it's so rare and why it's so powerful Alrighty, y'all from here on out we are entering manga spoiler territory so for my anime onlys head on out and we will see you guys in the next one but this question comes to us from Michael and wants to know my thoughts on Megami potentially becoming a villain. So I recently talked about this in a video. I will link that down below. But yes, I think it's possible. I think the relationship between Gojo and Geto is mirrored by the relationship between Yuji and Megami. So we'll have to see how this plays out. Next up, Tyler asks if Sukuna could beat Gojo without Maharaga. And I actually did a full what if breakdown on Gojo versus Heian era Sukuna, which is essentially this question. So I'll link that down below for you to check out. Next up, we got this question from Isaiah on why did Mai kiss Maki? And not to keep plugging old videos, but I did talk about this and kind of what happened with Maki when Mai passed away. So I will link that down below. But to me, she was just saying goodbye to her sister and it was possibly representative of her taking the remaining cursed energy from Maki as well. Next up, we've got this question from Chris asking, why doesn't Sukuna just go for the eyes with his slashes? And the simple yet unsatisfying answer here is just for the purposes of the story, right? If Sukuna's out there blinding everybody, what's, you know, where can we go from there? Um, but I would say that in the only person to ever have survived his domain is Gojo, and that's because he was healing through it. So I think it's certainly fair to say that Sukuna was slashing Gojo's eyes during the domain, but Gojo's RCT was just outputting enough to keep him on top of it at all times. And finally, y'all, we've got a couple of questions about Kenjaku from Draco. Feel free to pause and read them if you'd like. But to start with your second question about how Kenjaku keeps the techniques of his previous hosts, I have no idea, man. I would love to know. 
give me more information about Kenjaku, please. Because we know he neither has Kaori's mind or body, yet he still has the technique. So he somehow found a way to store them. Then, as far as the domain, I think you're right. Our best guess is that it's like a kotsu. He can imbue any of the techniques he has into his barrier and use them that way. That's going to do it for this one, y'all. Thanks again to everyone who made this possible, and I will see you in the next one.